Good morning. My name is uh, Emanuele Di Lorenzo from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and uh, I will be talking about a null hypothesis to explain climate-driven regime-like transitions in ecosystem species. This is work done in collaboration with Mark Homan as part of the California Current Ecosystem, LTER, and also of the Pacific Ocean Boundary Ecosystem and Climate Study, or POBEX. So it has been noted in the literature that ecosystems exhibit regime-like behaviors, uh, like the ones pointed out from in this paper by here Man Chuan and later uh, used by others. Uh, and in, for, in particular for the North Pacific has been noted that perhaps in 1977 and in around 1990 there were sharp uh, changes in the ecosystem species uh, of the Pacific. And of course there's been a lot of debate uh, as to whether are these real regime shifts and a lot of papers have been out that exploit in different using different statistics of whether these are true regime shifts in the meaning that we have a change in the equilibrium of the ecosystem species or rather uh, transitions that come from from climate uh, now while this is an interesting topic to discuss uh, what I'd like to ask is uh, what do these regime like changes tell us about the dynamics of the ecosystem variability and the dynamics of the ecosystem response uh, to climate forcing well, uh, to address that question, I'd like to examine two long-term time series of zooplanktons. Uh, these are observations collected in the California Current. Uh, this is the California coast, and this is the sampling region. Uh, this is uh, Southern California Bight, and so forth. These are two time series of zooplankton. Uh, this is the Nyctfenis uh, simplex here, and the Euphasia Pacific. Now, if we look at these uh, two time series, and, and we look at the character of the variability of these two time series, what we find is that uh, this uh, simplex species shows very smooth and low frequency changes in its tempo evolution, including, for example, this 1976 change from a negative to a positive uh, phase of this uh, of this species. While this Euphasia pacifica, uh, on the other hand, is dominated by a lot of interannual uh, variability. So the question then is. Why do some zooplankton time series exhibit sudden and prolonged transition on the Cato scales? So the goal here is to develop a null hypothesis, or if you like, a conceptual model of how the ecosystem variability is driven uh, by climate forcing. And, and this is because both of these species have been connected to different types of climate forcing uh, at different times. Now to answer or to achieve this goal, I, I'm going to begin by looking at the atmospheric variability. And this is here a plot in black, a time series of variability of the Aleutian low, uh, which we know is a pattern of uh, North Pacific atmospheric variability that has uh, a, a strong forcing or oceanic response in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Now this particular time series can be approximated as a white noise, which means um, that if we take uh, if we generate on the computer random time series uh, referred to as white noise, meaning that they have uh, energy at every single frequency, uh, then we find that uh, these randomly generated time series are very much, at least visually, uh, similar to the variability associated with this atmospheric forcing. And more specifically, when we talk about white noise, really what we are we're saying is that the variance uh, of associated with each of the frequencies of variability of this time series, meaning all the time scales of variability or the periodicity of, the, of this particular time series, uh, the variance is, is equal, meaning that every time scale has the same amount of energy, substantially. So this particular white noise assumption has been very useful for the atmospheric scientists to characterize the expected variability of an atmospheric variable. Now if we think of the ocean, uh, the ocean is predominantly forced by the atmosphere, especially in the North Pacific at the higher latitudes. And so if we want to characterize this uh, uh, response of the ocean to the atmospheric forcing, uh, then we can write a simple model where uh, we have that here F is, represents this time series of, of, uh, of atmospheric variability. And we can write a simple, very simple uh, equation for an oceanic variable saying that the rate of change of the oceanic variable here, phi, is forced by the atmosphere, in this case here. Uh, so this F represents the forcing. Now, this model is, is good, but we have to uh, add something else to make it really good. That is that as you force an atmospheric, an oceanic variable to change, uh, these changes will occur, but then at a some point there's going to be dissipation in the ocean, 
and, and therefore we have to add a term here, which I call the dissipation term, that is that the variable phi, the oceanic variable, will decay eventually to its uh, you know, mean condition uh, with a certain time scale that is given by this tau here, which we also refer as to the memory of the ocean, if you like, in the sense that when it's perturbed, it has some memory of the perturbation, which is a function of how fast it can dissipate. So if we use this very simple model, and we just take these time series of atmospheric uh, white noise, if you like, and we plug them into this model, and we solve this differential equation, which is very easy to do on a computer, uh, this is basically the result that we get. So the blue time series now are basically an integration of this atmospheric forcing. And what you see is that the character of the variability in these uh, blue time series is different from the previous one and has a little bit more uh, low frequency variance and less of that kind of high frequency noise that you've seen before. Now this type of model is very famous in the climate literature and is referred to as an autoregressive model of order one or if you like an AR1 model. And really essentially what this is is an integration of the white noise uh, uh, in this case of the atmosphere. Now this particular integration process has implications on the character of the variability of the time series and if we look at the power spectrum of, of this particular AR1 model, that is if we look at how the variance of, of this time series is distributed among the different frequencies or periodicities of this time, of this time series, we find that uh, the spectrum here has an inclination uh, and it increases its energy or its variance at the low frequency. So basically the result of this integration of the white noise provides us with the time series that has enhanced variability at the low frequency and reduced variability at the high frequency. So we start seeing like you know this uh, uh, integration effect provides more low frequency energy in these time series. Now if we look at if we look at the integration of the Aleutian low as we said, the Aleutian low drives in an oceanic response uh, into the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO. So we can basically compare this integrated Aleutian low uh, that comes from this AR1 model to, in fact, the PDO index. And if we did that, here in black is the PDO index, indeed we find a strong correlation of 0.61. And this is also telling us, of course, that uh, these changes in the PDO that have been also ascribed as regime shifts can actually emerge simply by integration effects of the white noise of the atmosphere through this um, uh, AR1 model. Now if we think of the biology, the biology is often driven by changes in the oceanic conditions. So here you find that you, the biology is kind of two, two steps down from the climate forcing of the atmosphere. And, and so again, you know, if we want to perhaps build a simple model to characterize the variability of an ecosystem species that is driven by the ocean, uh, what we can say is that the rate of change of, of the ecosystem species, which I'm going to represent here as epsilon in red, is forced by the ocean in the same way as the ocean was forced by the atmosphere. And in the similar way, so this is basically the, the oceanic forcing, we also know that as the, as the biology or the ecosystem species varies in time, uh, forced by the ocean, uh, it also dissipates these, uh, these forcings with a certain time scale again, and this, so this is again a dissipation term, where tau here is a time scale that is associated with the memory or of the biology. And so this could be, for example, the length of the life cycle or, or other things that, that are internal to the dynamics of biology. So with that in mind then, we could basically do the exercise of taking these blue time series, there are the oceanic variability if you like, and plug them into our simple model for biological variability. And if we did that, uh, this here, the red time series, is, is basically the output of this exercise. And on the top here, again, you have the Aleutian load that has been integrated twice. And here you have the white noise time series that have been integrated twice. And what you see now is that the character of the variability, again, has changed dramatically. And you, again, you see very smooth transitions with, uh, with uh, uh, if you like, decadal changes uh, from one state to the other. And you can see that the, the, the white noise doubly integrated has similar character. You can see things that look perhaps like regime-like changes. Uh, you can find trends. You can find decadal variability. And this is all to be expected by simply uh, this uh, double integration of the atmospheric forcing. So really what we've done here as we go from the atmospheric uh, 
variability that we expect to be some kind of white noise forcing, we've done this double integration all the way down to biology. And so in other words, we start with uh, an atmosphere or a climate system at the large scale that has perhaps uh, a lot of white noise type, meaning the energy is distributed among the various frequencies. It gets integrated once into the ocean, providing an enhancement here of the variance at the low frequency. And then this additional integration done, for example, for, from the biology, provides us with a power spectrum that now is very red, meaning it's this, this, the steepness of this is very strong. It's in, and in fact, it's true to the minus 4 in, in log space. And what really means is that now you really enhance mostly just a lot of energy at the low frequency, variant, low frequency variability and almost no energy at the high frequency, meaning you get these uh, smooth transitions. So this is an example of doubly integrated white noise where you have these very kind of smooth transitions. You can have trend. You can have things, again, that looks like these regime-like changes and drops and trends and, and so forth. So all this type of variability is to be expected by just this double integration of the, if you like, of the climate forcing. So the question now is, is our zooplankton species here in the, in the California current a good example of this uh, double integration effects or multiple integration effects? Uh, you know? and, and so let's address that. And uh, so let's ask the question then, is the zooplankton time series in the California current an example of multiple integrations of climate forcing? Well, if we look at this time series, it it has been noted that this krill species, the zooplankton species, is connected to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And indeed, if we, if we compare this time series with the PDO index, or the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, we do have a correlation that is significant of 0.41. However, you can already tell uh, by eye that the character of the variability of the, of the red index, that is the PDO, is different from the zooplankton time series, which is the blue index. Uh, the blue index is very smooth, the PDO again is very noisy at the high frequency, and, and so what is, most scientists would do at this point is say, well, you know, we can kind of filter out the high frequency variability of the PDO by just applying a, a low-pass filter or a running mean. And if you did that and you find what is the optimal filter, you will find that you can achieve correlations that are higher, and in this case 0.55, uh, between the PDO and this time series. And so the question now is, can we do better than this? Well, uh, if in order to approach this, then let's go back to the actual dynamics that control the zooplankton. So this zooplankton has been sampled in this area in the California current. Okay, this is the California coast here. But the reality is that the, originally the zooplankton lives further to the south of the sampling area. And so the idea that is behind this connection with the PDO is that when the PDO is positive, the currents along the coast tend to advect the species from the south into the California current. And so, so substantially, basically, it is the changes in the oceanic currents associated with the PDO that basically push the species into our domain. Now, we can capture this, this process, okay, very simply by writing, again, a one-dimensional equation where we say that the rate of change of the zooplankton in this area is equal to the PDO, meaning that when the PDO is positive, the rate of change increases, meaning you are increasing the amount of zooplankton, and when the PDO is negative, you're flushing out, if you like, these, these species uh, out of the sampling area. Now, the other important element, however, is that when these species are advected into the box, of course, they, they live, they don't just disappear because they have a certain life cycle. And so there is also a dissipation term that we add here. That is that when the zooplankton is advected in the box, the zooplankton can live there, but it's decaying slowly. And the time scale of decay is associated for example, with their life cycle, with the length of their life cycle, which for this particular zooplankton is about two to three years. So with this simple model then, we can, uh, we, we can immediately see that this, the formulation of this model is again identical to an AR1 model. We also note that the PDO here is already one integration of the atmospheric forcing. So this AR1 model is in fact a double integration of the atmospheric forcing or the white noise, if you like. So what we can do now is we can take the raw PDO index, put it in this model, and just solve this simple equation with the decay time scale of about two to three years, and compare it to this uh, uh, zooplankton observations. And if we did that, uh, this is the result of this uh, process model of integrating the PDO. And you can see that the, the, the comparison between the two time series has improved substantially 
we went from correlation of 0.5 to correlation of 0.8, in fact 0.84. But not only that, but you can also see that now the character of the variability of the reconstructed time series here in red is very much similar to the one of the blue time series, that is the observations. And this particular change in character of the variability does not come from artificially choosing a low-pass filter or a running mean, but just comes from uh, this integration effect uh, where the parameters of this model are actually chosen just based on, on, uh, on, on things that we think are true about the system, that is the time scale of the life cycle and just uh, the, uh, the, the oceanic forcing. So what have we done really? We started from atmospheric forcing, in this case the Aleutian low. We recognize that the atmospheric forcing drives an oceanic response that changes the transport and it's captured by the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And this process of atmospheric forcing to the ocean represents one integration of the atmospheric forcing. And then we realize that the changes in oceanic transport drive variability in the zooplankton and this indeed is the second integration. So this is in fact uh, perhaps uh, consistent with the idea that this double integration effect is important in explaining these low frequency changes at least of this zooplankton species. So really this model provides us with a null hypothesis for ecosystem low frequency variability that are expected in response to a climate forcing. Now, of course, the question is, does this uh, multiple integration effects also apply to fish? And, and here's a time series of anchoveta or anchovy uh, in the Pacific. And you can see again that even this time series has these very smooth uh, transitions. And, and, and if you just plot a time series of double integration, uh, you get uh, something you know, I've just picked a one random one, you get variability that is very similar to the one of the anchovies. Now, some people may say that, uh, you know, we already know that in the fish, the fact that the fish has a long life's history and so forth, uh, these type of smooth transitions are to be expected because of the memory of the, of the fish living such a long time. But the, the addition here, perhaps for the fish scientists, is the fact that not only the fish has memory because of the of the, of, the, of, the, of the fact that it lives a long time, but also uh, the smoothness, the character of the smoothness cannot be just explained by the memory of the fish. You also need to integrate multiple time uh, the, the climate forcing in order to get this type of smoothness in the time series. So the multiple cumulative integrative effects may be important. So going back to the zooplankton, which is what, what we were targeted to in this talk here, uh, we can say that we've developed a null hypothesis for how ecosystem species uh, respond to climate forcing, and that is that decadal scale smooth ecosystem transitions and variability can emerge from cumulative integrations of random climate forcing. Okay, this is all. Thank you very much.